for real. Your name is George McKenzie. <laughs> That, I hate saying my name. It sounds so weird. I hate that part of the every episode. Your name FYI. sounds weird to it you. Does. Does when it does. When I say it, it does. I feel like that's something you should unpack with a therapist. Mm, maybe. Maybe. The box is too big. <laughs> <laughs> this is Married to the Startup, where marital bliss meets entrepreneurial mayhem. George and Alicia have spent over a decade juggling five kids multiple startups, and a surprising amount of free time. On each episode, they'll dish on the triumphs and meltdowns that come with mixing family and startups. From the boardroom to the bedroom, no topic is off limits. Real and raw. Real and raw. And now your hosts, George, the CEO who traded the corporate grind for sleepless nights and investor tantrums, and Alicia, who swapped a peaceful life for the roller coaster of coaching entitled founders. This is Married to the Startup, where love meets chaos and entrepreneurship reigns supreme. Welcome to episode seven of Married to the Startup. I am your host, Alicia McKenzie. I'm Batman. <laughs> no? So I'm not supposed to say that. Do you remember Vine? Yes. And that guy who, I'm Batman. Yes. yes. Every, it was just like six second snippets of him saying, I'm Batman. I and know. We watched so many minutes of that. It, yes, we did. It was, it was really funny. Past the time. Yes. But for real, your name is George McKenzie. <laughs> that, I hate saying my name. It sounds so weird. I hate that part of the, every episode. Your name FYI. sounds weird to it you. Does. Does when it does. When I say it, it does. I feel like that's something you should unpack with a therapist. Mm, maybe. Maybe. The box is too big. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we are going to talk about a little bit of a boring topic, but I feel like it's something that people often ask my other half because he's done it for years. And that is government focused businesses. Yes. Because we live in the Washington, D.C. area and we are surrounded by several bases. We are surrounded by DOD, DOJ. Um, I'm sorry, Department of Justice, Department of Defense, um, Department of Homeland acronym Security. Soup. Uh, yes, acronym soup, a million acronyms for everything. But there are a lot of people in this area that go the startup route within government contracting. And they often will come to you with like, hey, where do I where do I find work? How do I get into this thing? Well, let's do it. Help. And you say. Don't. No, that's always my. No, um, I think it depends on where you're what you're coming from. Oftentimes it's people that are at the top end of their field, either they're a super technical resource and they say, you know, I've been working as this billable government contractor for one of the beltway bandits for X amount of years. And I want to do it. On and my who own. are the beltway bandits? That's it's more like the big government control thing. Yeah. Consulting firms. Like so, your Deloitte's. Like, you know, Deloitte, CACI, CACI, Mantech, Northrop. Accenture, ECS, Northrop Grumman, SAIC, and there's more in the DOD space that are huge too, even though most of those are big in Intel and DOD. Mm -hmm. But those are like the big publicly traded gigantic mega companies. Yes. And they control a lot of the contracting in this area. Yeah. And you know, how government contracts get awarded. You know, oftentimes, the more money you have, the more lobbyists you have, the easier it is to win work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hence like the Jedi contract and some of those other gigantic government cloud contracts that got ultimately like that one got torn apart, but you can see how the big boys win and you know, they basically position it so that there's not a chance a little person could win it. I do think in recent past SVDO, SBs, uh, service disabled veteran owned companies, um, minority owned companies, women owned companies. I think small set asides are beginning to happen for yeah. people like that and companies like that. Yeah, I think the Obama administration really took progressive action to put more money toward those. And I think uh, the Biden administration similarly followed suit. Like when I talk to folks when they're starting their government consulting companies, what what one what kind of company are you? Are you a services based company or are you a product platform or software based company? And, you know, those have a lot of implications further down the path on, you know, how you set up your corporate structure and how you set up compensation for your employees and how you view your employees. Like, what is it at the end of the day you're selling? And for most folks, like on the initial part of the conversation here, highly technically skilled folks, most of the times their their asset is themselves, right? They've 
been doing the work for so long and they're like, Hey, I want to start my own business. And instead of the beltway bandit making all the money on this, you know, labor rate contract, I want to make all that money instead of the, them making $200 an hour. I want to make $200 an hour. And you know, most of those conversations are if, if that's your end goal is you want to make more on an hourly basis, then, you know, the 1099 route is probably the way to go. But most of the time, that's not what they, the end goal they want. They want a real company with, you know, multiple employees running their own contract. And, you know, that is much, much more difficult. And that's the hardest part when I tell people is the first, you know, starting your business and getting a role for yourself is really easy. Mm -hmm. Well, relatively easy if you're, if you're already in there, if you're, uh, if you've already got your foot, if you're talented and the government, the client likes you or, your your current employer likes you that it's pretty easy to you know negotiate and become a 1099 mm -hmm. but it's how do you sell your company not you yeah when at the end of the day the product is services so the product is people how do you sell the fact that you're able to deliver people that aren't you and i've seen you know numerous times throughout my career talking to folks where they start a company they get a slot for themselves or maybe a slot for themselves and one other person. Mm -hmm. And it's on the contract they've always been on or with the customer they've always been on. And they're like, I just can't grow. Can't get outside of this. You know, how do I do it? And I think that's the tricky part, right? It's selling yourself is easy. Yeah. Selling yourself is easy. It's you know, convincing other people that you can find somebody who is as good or better than you. And then yeah. having them give you a slot for that person. Right. And do you have a real company? Yeah. Is it a real company that is delivering services or is it just you? And a friend. And a friend. Yeah. So it's when you start that company, what kind of company is it? Like mm -hmm. you've talked about before, um, do you have any disadvantaged status? Mm -hmm. Is it a small business? Are you a veteran? Is it a veteran owned small business? Is it a woman owned small business? Is it a disabled veteran owned small business? Do you live and have employees in a hub zone? Like all of these delineations help you to get work. So once you know, you know, hopefully you have one of those or you have some number of those, you know, creating the building blocks. And a lot of people I've talked to, oftentimes they go out and they say, hey, I'm trying to prime work. How come I, I can't prime work? I don't find government contracts that I can bid on or the ones I bid on, I don't win. And, you know, part of that is you got to build a healthy business. It's really hard to have a two-person shop and think you're going to win a big contract. Yeah. Right? You need past performance. You need to demonstrate your ability to do the work. And, you know, most of the times the way that happens is you start with a couple slots and then you work with some of those Bellway bandits or other other larger primes. And you got to talk to the the, you know, the business development folks in those shops or their small business you know advocates in those companies and pitch yourself and pitch the company and what you stand for, how you're differentiated from others. And all those statuses we just talked about become the assets that you have to tout. And you have to go to industry days. And when you go to those industry days for the companies, you have to, for the um, government agencies, you have to try to make friends with those other, you know, so-called competitors, but the ones that are bigger than you that are bidding things and, and are looking for small businesses to help round out their team and also to meet some of those small business. Um, but there's credits. also there's also platforms that you can go to to go out and find government contracts. Uh, there's a couple of them. I mean, there are there are. But the and I have seen people or at least I've seen within social media, people are winning work <clears throat> via these platforms. I personally haven't had a ton of success mm -hmm. doing that. And I think there's the spray and pray approach. And there's also, you know, you can go to GovWin or some of these other platforms that you can buy that show you opportunities. But mm -hmm. unless you are bidding LPTA or you have some set aside where you're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, mm -hmm. which I don't think is a viable business strategy. It's really around you got to build your business up. Then you use your past performance to win some of these vehicles and schedules like the GSA schedule or there's other IDIQs or GWACs that come out that you can bid on. But to win those, you have to have past performance. You have to have demonstrated your ability to deliver to the government. You have to have rate structures that are defensible. So those things aren't just something you make up. You have to actually have them. And I'll, a, a good example is you had a lunch with somebody last week. I won't say his name. I'm sure if he hears this, he's going to know I'm talking about him. But you have worked with this kid since he was in high school and he has done internships with your companies and he has gone off to college and now he's getting ready to graduate. And he met with you because he's like, all right, I'm ready to do this. How do I get started? Yeah. My advice was very similar is that, you know, 
find a, a, a role for yourself and maybe another person, build past performance and leverage your connections like crazy to get past performance. And then once you have those, you know, start to look at schedules in which you can start to prime. But also and, he's not coming in blind. He's got a ton of back end knowledge. He's done a lot of work with you and mm -hmm. he's, he's a sharp kid. He's really sharp. Yeah. And he knows what he wants to do, but it's also, you can't come into this game and just expect to make it. Right. And I think the, to your point of buying these portal access things that show you opportunities, I, I mean, I think that's a late, later stage of the business, not, Absolutely. not first stage of the business and building relationships with your partners is a great way to start. And then eventually you need to parlay that into building relationships with contracting offices within the government agencies you want to target. Look at their small business. Look at the budget that they have for the upcoming year. What is earmarked? What programs are earmarked for the work that you do or the services you offer or the software that you sell? And then you have to go in and there's a lot of work. It's not like on the commercial side where you can go schmooze the CISO or CIO or whoever the, the budget owner is and then find your technical champion or he could be your champion and then you wine and dine and, and get the work, right? She yes. On the federal side, it's a much different, longer procurement cycles most times. I mean, there's obviously ways in which that can be expedited, but let's say it's a normal federal. Everything just moves slower within the government. Yeah, civilian sector, government contract, right? Mm -hmm. They normally have to budget plan a year or two out, yeah. right? You have to go that budget cycle. Then you have to do the industry day and then you have, you know, um, a source of salt and then you have an RFI and then you have an RFP and then the whole process. Request right? for information, request for proposal. Right. And you have that, that whole process. And then some of them are released on government contracting vehicles. So you have to be on that vehicle to even be able to bid the work. Yes. It's not always, you know, Hey, this is put out to the world. It's not open source. Right. So, you know, understanding all of those and understanding how to shape work, right. Getting with the contracting offices, go to the industry days, Showing you got to have something of value, right? And you have to write a proposal that demonstrates that value. Which, okay, let's let's switch gears. Writing proposals. Do you think it's going to become easier with the introduction of everything AI? Yes. Yeah. And this is something I, I haven't done yet, but I want to. Yeah. Is just to take an RFP uh -huh. and respond to it 100% with AI derived content. Just to see. Yeah. Just to see what happens. Yes. Just to see. It'd be interesting to see if the evaluator is only looking for keywords for demonstration of understanding of the, the, the SAL or the PWS. And, mm -hmm. and I think AI would be really great at regurgitating back something. Absolutely. That sounded good. I mean, AI has put a couple of documents together that we would have gone to a lawyer for. Yeah. And I think the, that the future of AI is going to be, I wouldn't say future. It's already happening. It's yeah. a part of everything already. And I mean, my, my, most of it is going to be under the, the radar. Yeah. My mom uses chat GPT now. I know. So that, I that? feel like that is a turning point. If you can get my mother to adopt something, that's like, I, I feel like that's a line in the sand that, okay, this is actually happening. Like it took her forever to get to switch to an iPhone. Right. And it took her forever to uh, use our Teslas comfortably. Yeah. Like she did not want to drive a Tesla. She didn't trust the, the, um, autopilot, the autopilot, she didn't trust any of it. And now she hates driving anything with gas. Yeah. I mean, it, it, AI's ability to generate code on the fly is it's it's getting better and better, but it's going to be the underpinning of a lot of things. It's like, you know, when you ask a chat GPT, the chat bot being able to ask questions versus Google. Yeah. Right. Just ask the question, get the response back versus ask a web browser and then look through the results and go to the website, click the link, try to figure out what the answer is. Or even, but, even the meeting I had yesterday, she had an artificial intelligence assistant. And two hours after the meeting, I got a full recap of the meeting with action items. She did none of it. Yeah. So it's no, going to be no virtual assistant. Yeah. No, it, it's all artificial intelligence. Yep. It's going to, or I think it already is a part of Zoom and a yeah. part of, you know, uh, all those virtual meetings where it's going to summarize, send out action items. You're not going to need EAs anymore to do that. That'll I mean, automatically that's, be done. that's where I got my start, right? I was, I was brought on as an EA and I was doing meeting minutes. And when I was like 19 years old, Yeah, like that was like one of my, that was one of my first jobs. Outside yes. of working at the mall when I was 16, I think everybody went through one of those. But <laughs> yeah, I, I was brought on solely as somebody's EA to do meeting minutes. Yeah, I and wonder what's going to happen. You know, wh where where are those Alicia's at 19 going to find their first job? Um, content creation. 
Mm-hmm. And you don't think AI will jump into that realm? Or I don't think so. Replace some of that? I think it'll replace some of it because there is work that I used to farm out to VAs and now ChatGPT does a lot of it. And it's, is it the downfall of creativity or is it going to open up barriers for people who, I don't know, felt like they're missing that one piece of the puzzle in order to be successful? Yeah, I think the barrier to information is going to be lower and the ability to scale will be higher. Like allowing AI to help you be a help desk to answer via chat questions or common FAQs or be able to help uh, derive documentation. So if you're building a SaaS platform, there's AIs out there already that have language models that are trained that if you point and click and and drive around your application with it, it'll help generate the documentation for you. Mm -hmm. So you don't need this army of, of documentation specialists and what often, you know, having developed platforms, it's it's the weakest link and being an, an architect or engineer documenting something is the least of the things you want to do. So it's often the shittiest, right? So yeah. having AI be able to crank through that and give you something that you can just tweak up is going to be, you know, a, a dramatic improvement, but it'll help businesses scale to say now that the business today needs 200 people, you know, to be able to operate, you know, maybe you can do it at a hundred when you have AI doing a lot of that back end work for you. Yeah. I think one of the main concerns, or at least a, a very large concern is that where is AI pulling their information from? Where, where is it learning from? And is that, is that information that it is regurgitating? Is it copyrighted material? Is it, is it pulling from Reddit? Where is it, where, where is it all coming from? Yeah. I think the, yeah. You know. Understanding, not with getting the details of AI and the the large language models that make up the different you know chat bots that we talk about, but you know that's going to be the cornerstone. It's going to be the data races, the arms race, right? It's how do you get data in that you want the language model to be trained on to give answers on? Like who controls or who's the authority of that data? And then within your business, if you're using you know your own language models or a language model that's pre-trained that you're going to ingest your data into for your private, you know language model Mm -hmm. of once that data gets in there, how do you know who has access to ask the questions? And, you know, at that point, most of the times the language models aren't built for any access controls or role-based access controls. You're going to ask the question. It's going to give you the answer. And if it has the data or knows the data, like it will give you it. So having a, a language model open to the whole company that has all your financials and all your policies and maybe all your proposal documentation because you want it to spit out mm-hmm. you know, new proposals based on previous content or you want to do statistical analysis work on Are you for, opening forward yourself projections. Up? Yeah. Could that help desk operator ask the LLM the same question and get the same data out? Yeah. Are you opening up yourself to vulnerabilities? Yeah, for Uh, sure. Yeah. But I think another issue is the creativity portion. Like, is this going to take every creative's job or is it, is it going to start impacting the work that we give to other creatives? But I think having just written a book and I was curious to see how chat GPT would spit out a book. It did a fucking terrible job. It was awful. Like a chat GPT written book was one of the most driest like paragraphs I've ever read in my life. So I think that portion of the creativeness is safe because it's hard to mimic what's coming out of somebody's head and the stories they're creating in their mind and putting onto paper. I don't think that is something AI can recreate. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see as you know it gets smarter. I mean, is it are we reaching the pinnacle or are we just scratching the surface of how, you know, the neural networks work and what it can, is it going to get more creative? Could it get more creative over time when it digests more or, or is trained more? I don't know. And yeah, it's back to that. You know, will AI destroy us all? Probably 50, 50 chance. Yeah. I mean, I watched iRobot and I kind of feel like (laughs) Will Smith was ahead of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Either iRobot or uh, Wally. Oh, we are so heading towards Wally. We are. If you haven't watched that movie, it's a Disney movie, obviously. Hashtag five kids. Mm-hmm. But we watched Wally when uh, our oldest was like, what, two? It's probably when it came out. Yeah. Ava loved Wally. She did. But it's it's a really, is it art mimicking life or life mimicking art? I think it was prophetic. It was very out in the future, but you could see it as a reality. And what happens if you haven't seen the movie is that humans destroy the planet 
and are forced into spaceships and they're living in space, which means that there's less activity. Everybody is overweight and they're all in these uh, like flo chairs. floating wheelchairs yeah. that are motorized because they can't walk because they're too fat. Yeah. And everything is fed to them through a straw and the TVs they watch are projected in front of their eyeballs so yeah. they don't even have to get up. It was it was very and marketers dreams. So the one scene was like, ooh, red, it's the new blue. And then everyone immediately changes their outfit to blue yeah. or red right. from blue. Like yeah. everybody's is, yeah, lemmings that are marketed to by the algorithm. And there's this one little robot. His name is Wally. And he is on Earth trying to salvage things. And he discovers a plant and like saves the world. But uh, back to AI. I don't know. I don't I, I think we're. Yeah, I think it's the it's going to be the underpinning of almost everything. And you just won't even we won't be talking much about AI. It'll just be the foundation of things like it, you'll be getting better services through the mass production of AI and integration of AI without knowing it. And it's already happening. Well, I think one of your action items is to go write a proposal with nothing but AI. And then we'll just publish it. We'll publish it on my website just to see what it looks like. Yeah. See how it responds. Yeah. And I wonder if you, you know, if you fed it the, you know, the requirements mm -hmm. from the proposal, if it would be compliant yeah. and you know, compelling. I think that's a good, that's a good experiment that we're going to, we're going to try. All right. So now we're going to segue into an article that my husband sent me recently and it's, uh, the title is Lacework Last Valued at $8.3 billion is in talks to sell for just 150 to $200 million. That's uh, quite a drop in valuation. What happened? Yeah, and uh, like less than a year, I think, since their last raise or just over a year. It's, it's very indicative of the, the market right now and the economy that we're living in, that either things are tremendously overvalued. And I think when money was cheap and there was very, very low interest rates, that market valuations became this unicorn. I think that that's something that most people know or maybe don't know that things were frothy market. Yeah. Market valuations are not based in reality. <laughs> like yes. it's not like it's somewhat loosely based on its competitors, but it's all forward thinking. So it's not like the real estate market. We say, Hey, this house sold for X per square foot. So now my, my house is valued at X per square foot. And yes, I go that's for, very, that's concrete. And I work from there where, you know, these are all about the future and, you know, Hey, what's the TAM and SOM and, Oh, I'm going to uh, total addressable market or your service obtainable market. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, Oh, it's got a TAM of 500 billion. And Oh, if I only captured 1% of that 500 billion, I'd be $5 billion company. Yeah. And that's just so much bullshit that it makes no sense at all. Yeah. But you know, it, it's up to the person who's creating the valuation to sell it to everybody else and then say, as an investor, hey, we think this company is going to be worth or is currently worth $8.3 billion because we are a cloud-based SaaS CSPM and you know we're in the security market, which is growing and it's the convolution of you know, the security market into the, you know, the cloud market. And it's creating this, this market space that we're going to be the leader in. And we have this app and we have all this ARR that's growing and annual you know, recurring revenue. And that's where we're going to be 8.3 billion. Okay. And then they raise money. So people are buying shares with the shares being valued right yeah. at this 8.3 billion only so to turn around and a year later go, Oh, we're sold it for 200 million. Yeah. So that share that, of this $8.3 billion company that you bought is now a share of a $200 million exit. And a little bit about this company, it was founded nine years ago. And over the last, what I think over that, over the last decade, it's raised 1.8 billion from investors. Yeah. So um, we were, we, we definitely know Laceworks in my previous companies. We def definitely know them. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting and it, it's everywhere. It's, you know, it's like watching Shark Tank and you see the guys out there pitching going, hey, we're going to sell X percent of the company for $500,000. And then, you know, you see the, every every of the sharks do the back of the napkin of what, yeah. the, what the valuation is. And then, you know, because we've explained that to to your mom and people at home, like, what does that mean? And yeah. Like, oh, well, they're selling, you know, $10,000 for 10%. So the value of the company is $100,000 because they're selling 10% of it at 10,000. So the whole must be 100,000. Mm -hmm. And then pre-money, post-money, the, the, we won't get into the specifics of that stuff. How many, I wonder how many of those but, deals actually make it to the table, uh, make it through due diligence. What is it? Probably like 5%. You yeah, think? It's probably a much smaller percentage. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, I think back to this article, it's, the frothiness of, of that market. And I think there it's coming down dramatically here, but 
Well, and most of the money, most of the funds raised happened in 2021. Yeah. And cyber was super hot and everybody was dumping money. And I think the market has changed now where they're looking at companies that, you know, God forbid, actually make money. Yeah. They are profitable, not just cash drains where you're spending money to buy revenue and you're producing revenue at negative EBITDA with this hope that at some point there's the intersection between uh, cost and revenue Mm -hmm. and that revenue continues to grow exponentially and cost drops off a cliff. So do you think this is a cautionary tale for... (laughs) I think it's, it's, I don't know, I'm sure it's a cautionary tale for investors, but it's also one in which it's just, you know, understanding that when you see those market headlines, you see these valuations and you know, one of the guys, the last company I was at was, it's all they talked about was, oh, this company got this valuation and they got this valuation and we should look to go public and get this valuation and this valuation. Valuations are, they don't mean a they lot. don't mean anything, right? It, it means something to the person who's giving you money because that's what their shares are going to be valued at. Yeah. But yeah, that valuation, just like here, you go from 8.3 billion to 200 million in 18 months or 12 months or whatever. I mean, it's Uh, name another asset class where that happens that quickly. And, you know, the stock market, at least it's a publicly traded, you know, entity. So the valuations there are based on a lot of people mm -hmm. that are all correlating and coalescing around what they think the valuation and the market cap for this company is. Which don't get me started on that. But it's a lot of eye, it's a lot of eyeballs. And then that, at that, yeah, we can talk about forever. (laughs) Why, why do certain people only get access to IPOs? Why are, why yeah. are there aftermarket trading that's only allowed for certain people, yeah. right? And not the everyday consumer can participate in after hours or pre-market trading. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it gets weird, but at least then you have this huge data, a lot of data points around what a, a valuation is. Where yeah. in the venture capital market, it is a very small amount. And oftentimes, you know, the investment banker will come out with a valuation like Shark Tank where, hey, I'm selling X percent for this much money. This is what I'm raising at. So this is the valuation. And, you know, if it's a good investment bank or it's a good capital partner, you know, credible one, then other people say, well, it must be if they think it is, let's all jump on board. And they oversubscribe and they get raised capital at that valuation. But also, okay, let's say this thing sells for 200 million. Let's say, okay, it makes it through diligence or it makes it through due diligence. It closes at 200 million. Everybody walks away with 200 million in their pocket. No. Right? Well, See, no, I think that's what it sounds two, like. 200 million to spread across everyone who's already invested 1.3 yes, billion. Exactly. So, so 200, 200 pen, million. Pennies on the dollars. Uh-huh. But yeah. the first guys in will get the better treatment, most likely. Top of the stack. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. But it's crazy, like, you know, people that aren't in the industry that, you know, they see these valuations, they get so hung up on valuation when the only number that matters is what you sell at. Yep. Right. That that's the number that matters. Like you can go to an investment banker and they can say, oh, you're 20, your, your valuation would be 10 times EBITDA or 20 times EBITDA or 30 times EBITDA or five times EBITDA. It's all, you know, I think, uh, my old CRO had a great quote that, you know, driving around looking at houses or looking at anything and it's like, how much is this worth? How much is this worth? It's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So when you raise valuations, if someone's willing to pay that for the share, that's where it's worth at that point. But that doesn't mean that the next guy is going to value it the same way. Absolutely. And EBITDA is earnings before. Interest, interest taxes, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And amortization. You've been listening to Mary to the Startup. These two crazy people have spent over a decade juggling five kids and multiple startups and discussing everything from the boardroom to the bedroom. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, hook up with us on social media at Married to the Startup. And be sure to hit the website at www.marriedtothestartup.com. Take it easy, and we'll see you next time.